so I wanted to just kind of introduce, you know, um, how alcohol kind of came into, into the picture. Um, because I was still attending and I was in my faith, you know, examination process at that time. And that summer we moved into a house that we had just built into a new neighborhood. And we, you know, we didn't have a lot of new friends, you know, we were kind of beginning to step out of our church community more. And so, you know, as we're moving into this new neighborhood, you know, we see, you know, someone walking down the street, hi, who are you? Like, nice to meet you. Would you like to come over for a barbecue? So this uh, guy, his name was Dallas, you know, um, just met him, brought a six pack of beer with him. And, um, you know, it's like, okay, well, I don't really believe in the, you know, the word of wisdom per se anymore, the doctrine and covenants for what it was, you know. Um, so it was like, okay, well, why, why wouldn't we try a drink? You know, why wouldn't we, you know, experiment a little bit here? Um, and so we didn't drink anything at that point in time with this neighbor who brought the six pack of beer. Um, but we, <laughs> um, we kept it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> And we didn't toss it. So Scott's like, well, you know, should we, you know, just give it a try and see what it's like? And I was like, okay, you know, like, but I've got some concerns, you know, like his side of the family has a history of alcoholism. Um, so I was concerned at the get go, like maybe we were entering something that, you know, could, you know, be problematic in the future, I guess. So I was like, okay, well, we're going to set some boundaries with it. We, you know, we, we can drink, but, you know, we're not ever going to drink alone. You know, we are not going to, you know, excessively drink or anything like that. Um, you know, I don't want my parents to know about this, you know, sort of thing, because they live in our community. Um, so we, we kind of set some boundaries in the beginning. And so we tasted our first sip of beer that night and I thought it was disgusting. Um, but you know, time rolling forward, you know, Scott was like, well, let's try wine. And so tried some red wine. Uh, he went on his mission to Chile and I believe the first bottle he bought was a Chilean wine, red wine. Um, and so we tried that and I was like, okay, that's, you know, that's, that's different, very different, you know, from anything I've ever tasted because I was used to my hot cocoa and my, you know, sugary sodas and, you know, those sorts of things. So it was a different flavor for me. And then moving forward, uh, you know, it wasn't until like we bought a champagne, something bubbly, and I threw some blueberry mixer in it, <laughs> like that I was like, okay, you know, I can, I can actually tolerate drinking that. Um, so, so it always off. starts out being, and I've never, just for yeah. my audience, I've still not tried alcohol. So I'm weird yeah. that way. Well, I'm 50 years old. I was kicked out of the church. Like I have every reason I can't go a week without somebody offering it to me. And for some reason yeah. I've still never tried it, but everyone yeah. always says at first, I don't like it. It's not good. Yeah. Like it was gross. It tastes like right. paint thinner. It's always yeah. that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, you know, and it's interesting, you know, it's like, okay, well, maybe my body was actually telling me this isn't good for you. And that is gross for a reason. <laughs> but, um, but so, you know, but there became this like, social aspect of it. So like, as time moved forward, um, I mean, this is the summer of 2012 that we had our first sip. And then um, we, we got pregnant with our third child in September that year. And so like, obviously I put a hold on, on drinking or trying different alcohols because I mean, there's so many drinks out there, so many different types of mixed drinks, whatever to try. And we live in a community where there's a lot of craft breweries here, wineries, those sorts of things. So they're close by. It's like part of the culture here. Um, you know, plenty of bars close by to go to as well. So I mean, we hadn't really started dabbling in the social aspect of it too much at that point. You know, we'd open a bottle of wine and it was, you know, maybe we drank half of it. So we each had a glass and that was it. Um, <clears throat> so, so I get pregnant with my, you know, we get pregnant with our third child. Um, we, you know, um, I turned 30 um, in January of 2013 and 
I was like, I was pregnant and I had friends visiting from Boston who had no idea that I was leaving on my way out of the church, um, that I was drinking at all because they were my friends that drank, you know, but I never hung out with them that way out in Boston. Um, they were my nursing school friends and they, um, you know, I was like, well, it's, I'm turning 30, so I'm going to have a glass of wine on my 30th birthday and I don't care if I'm pregnant. So like I began to just like make these little justifications in my head that, you know, it's not that much. It's doing no harm, you know, whatever. Um, people in France drink wine when they're pregnant, whatever. So I just, you know, started making these justifications in my head. Okay. So up to that point, yeah. how long had you been drinking prior to sort of drinking when you were pregnant? Um, only like a couple months. So. And it was, and it was, again, it was like once a week, how maybe, maybe once a week. Yeah. Nothing. Glass nothing of wine, glass mm -hmm. of beer. Or, or we go out to dinner and I'm going to have a martini. I, you know, and I think and when you start, is it like, Oh, this will never be a problem. I've got this. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm in control. Like I've got total control of this situation. Right. Like, I'm being cautious about it. I've always thought of myself as a very responsible person. So I was like, I've, I've got this, like I'm in control. I'm good. So those are the things we tell ourselves. <laughs> so Okay. And um, how long did it take before it went from tasting awful to being okay? Um, it Not probably forward. took, a, you know, like, I don't know, a couple months. Okay. I mean, it was still with, I mean, because I got pregnant pretty quickly after trying the first drink, I didn't really start delving into different drinks very quickly. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, looking back, it's like, okay, you know, it started off very innocent, very much in a controlled situation, I thought, you know, but, you know, I don't, it was like, well, I'm never going to be the drunk person on the side of the road puking. I'm never going to be the person, the homeless person with a bottle in a bag, you know, like those things, like, I'm not that, like, I'm very separate from that. So I'm not, that's not who I am. Um, so, so fast forward to like Scott and I traveled to Mexico. Oh, and really quick, is oh, it yeah. pretty, is it pretty established that pregnant women shouldn't drink alcohol? I mean, Absolutely. you're a nurse. Absolutely. Yes. Because <laughs> yep. it's bad for, it's bad for the baby. It's and you're a nurse, so you know I'm that. Nurse. I know this and I totally. And I'm not trying to shame you. I'm just oh, saying no. this is how it happens. No, I, I take, yeah, this is how it happens. We all make, you know, and I, and I'll tell you along the way here okay. that I've made some very poor choices along the way. So, okay. um, so yeah, so that was probably my first like, you know, I'm being kind of irresponsible <laughs> with it, you know, moment. But, you know, it was funny because my dad had forgotten something at my house and my friends were there on my birthday and we had our wine out and my dad had forgotten his like tablet or something at the house and he came back and he knocked on the door and we're like, hide the wine, like shoving it under the sink, like we're 14, you know, <laughs> right. hide it. Um, I don't want him to know, especially because I'm pregnant and they would be like, I, I would feel ashamed or, or, or a disappointment to my family. You know, I was already a disappointment for leaving the church in my own head. And I was, you know, going to further And of course, that. And yeah. of course, all, all believing Mormons think that the first thing any ex-Mormon is going to do is start drinking alcohol, right? Right. Yeah. And I didn't want to be like this. The stereotype. Yeah. I did not want to be the stereotype. I mean, that was not why I left the church. I did not leave the church so I could drink. So I could left drink. the church yeah. for, for, <laughs> right. for many other reasons. Um, I mean, but I was still going at this time. So <laughs> again, I was living this double life um, in a way. And so, you know, I, I definitely that spring, you know, before Scott and I had our third child, um, you know, we, the, the communication about where we were, where our relationship was in regards to, you know, like the church and like expectations, you know, now that had shifted within the marriage, um, you know, regarding drinking and, you know, all sorts of things. It was like, you know, what are we doing on Sundays now? You know, and, and I wasn't like, let's go find another church. And he was kind of like, well, should we try some other ones? And it was like, no, I don't really feel like doing that. So, um, we, we had some communication issues. And so we, we did go to the Gottman Institute workshop down in Seattle for a couple days. And that's, um, that's top notch stuff. John oh, yeah. Gottman and his wife, oh, yeah. they've, they've made Amazing. some of the best, they've done some of the best research in the world on how to make a marriage healthy and happy. Yes. And so I was like, we need something here. You know, we need, we need something to get through this because this whole faith crisis thing has been like the biggest upheaval 
you know, we've had in our marriage. So, so we went to that, got some really great tools, really good workshop. I, I hands down have recommended it to several friends who are going, you know, through difficult times. Like, I think it's extremely helpful. Um, uh, it's, it's a great workshop and, and he's got YouTube videos and books and all that stuff. Really, really great resources. But I, I think that was like the first time I was like, okay, we are both very human right now in this, you know, in this part of our lives. And we need to be, you know, really just, you know, the walls need to come down. Um, so that spring I wrote a letter to my family saying I was done with the church, um, or that I was going to go on a six month hiatus, um, from it just to, you know, cause I really started feeling like an outsider looking in, um, you know, I'd opened up to my primary or my young women's presidency that I was working with at the time, just like sharing my concerns. And, you know, I mean, and, and I went to my bishop and asked to be released. Um, at, at one point, I just, I, I just couldn't feel good about teaching stuff I didn't believe in anymore, because I just, it wasn't something I could do. Like, it just created a lot of anxiety and a lot of um, internal discord. So, I, you know, wrote this letter to my family and friends, and I'm very grateful that my family didn't disown me or shame me. They said, we love you no matter what. Um, I have a sister that left the church long ago, um, you know, and I, I think they've always held out hope that she would come back. And I, you know, for a period of time, I think my parents probably held out that same hope for me until I was very verbal about not returning to the church a, a couple of years later. Um, but but yeah, so I, I was, I was done. I, I said, you know, I, I just, I need to move on from this. Like I've spent the last couple of years now just delving into this, you know, and I've come to my own conclusions and I'm tired of living for this eternity that I no longer believe in right now. Um, so I just, I couldn't, couldn't continue. So, and, and this is, right before our third child was born. So, you know, there's things like, okay, there's not going to be a baby blessing. You know, there's not going to be, you know, those things. What are we going to do about raising our kids now? You know, like there's still a lot of questions that were happening and, and a lot of pain, you know, like being a disappointment to my family was huge. Um, I never, as a, as a youth, that was such a driver for me, you know, like just proving to my parents that I could be this great kid who was on the straight and narrow path and you know, to tell them like, sorry, I'm, I'm done with this path was extremely painful. Let me ask you, let me ask you, did you consider, did you ever consider, cause this is where Mormonism is going today in yeah. 2019. It's this idea that you can be a Mormon on your own terms. I've heard mm -hmm. Carolyn Fiona Gibbons and others that are basically yeah. saying Patrick Mason talks about a truth cart. You right. know, and I talked about this early on about just being a buffet Mormon or a liberal yeah. Mormon. Yeah. We're like, you drink alcohol when you want, you go to church when you want, you pay whatever percent and you just, you be a Mormon, just like a, a Presbyterian or a Methodist or a Lutheran, right. you stay right. in the church, but you just do what you want. And it's right. nobody's business what you do in your private life. Did you guys right. consider that option or not really? Um, you know, I'm trying to think back, you know, I, I didn't really feel like that was a path for me at the time. Um, and it still feels kind of wrong in my own head right now to even think about trying to do it that way. And I know that works for some people. And I feel like I'm, I'm happy for them. I know people stay for the community, you know, they might do it their own way, but that's, that's okay. Like, you know, you've got to do what you've got to do. Um, you know, for me personally, I just couldn't, you know, I don't think I could have ever walked into an interview with a bishop and, you know, felt like I could be my, my true self or truly just be like, yeah, I don't believe this, but why do I want to go to the temple anyway? You know, like, why, why, am I, why am I continuing to participate in these things and then put myself at, you know, like basically creating this fissure within myself, you know, of like, I don't believe it. So why am I pretending that I am, you know, or that I do, you know, I just, I, I, I couldn't do it for myself. Yeah. And the, and the, because the church asks that they have those worthiness interviews to go to the temple right. and, and they have tithing, you know, tithing settlement where, right. you know, they're asking how much you're paying. And if you're a hundred percent tithe payer, it kind of, it doesn't leave people the flexibility of having this private no, life. That's no they're, one's they're, business, right? Right. Exactly. You have to There's be a no liar. Space. Yeah. You have to be a liar, liar or hide, 
or you tell the truth and you get in trouble and who wants to do Yeah, that? you know, and it's interesting because, you know, there's that term priesthood roulette. Like my husband, he did talk to our bishop out east and he basically pushed his recommend across the table to his bishop or bishop at the time and said, I just don't know if I believe in this stuff anymore. And the bishop passed it back to him. You know, I don't think that would have happened <laughs> here in my ward here. You know what I mean? Oh, like, yeah. I, he says, I don't care, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's just like, I don't know. I don't even know if I want to, like, why should I have to do that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, why should I have to, like, be worthy of God's presence in my life? Why should I have to even have this interview? You know what I mean? Like, there were things that were just becoming... um difficult for me to reconcile in my head, like as a reason why I would put myself in that position. So, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to go to the temple. You know, I don't feel like I need a worthiness interview to, you know, have God in my life or a higher power or whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I guess I should say at the end of my faith crisis, I kind of came out as an agnostic and I probably relate more with Buddhism than anything at this point. But, um, Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. So as we, you know, kind of move forward, I had, you know, our child, you know, we're still kind of mulling around in these emotions of, you know, guilt or shame or, you know, being a disappointment to family, to, you know, our, our friends at church or, you know, we just, you know, it, it, it's an uncomfortable place to be. Let's just put it that way. As most yeah, people. totally. Yeah, it was really uncomfortable. And so, you know, and as we were, you know, I felt rejected by my community. You know, when I did the wear the pants to church day, I had parents of young women's, you know, some of my youth, like, tell their girls they needed to unfriend me on Facebook over that, you know, or if I was outspoken, if I spoke up about anything, you know, regarding the LGBTQ community, or, you know, something else, like, I, it, my ideas and my thoughts were not accepted, you know, and I just felt, you know, very rejected from, from the community, even my own Relief Society president who I grew up babysitting her daughter, you know, like axed me off her Facebook, you know, it's just like, this is, I'm just not going to put myself in these painful places anymore. So I was done. And, but those emotions still remain, you know, a feeling rejected by a community that you loved, um, by, you know, just your true friends stick with you. The ones that weren't your true friends, but you thought were, you know, they, they back away, like, you know, you're some plague to be avoided, you know, and they'll smile nice and whatever. But, um, yeah, it was, it was hard. Yeah. And you know, that, you know, we talk about the LGBT community and how, devastating it is to lose the respect of your family and friends and the community. Right. And, you know, we know that that leads to suicidality amongst the LGBT community yeah. from the family acceptance project work out of San Francisco state university right. and Caitlin Ryan, but, but post Mormons experience the same type of thing. It's devastating yeah. to have your whole worldview collapse. Yeah. And now you're viewed as dark and loathsome by all your family. You lose your community. You lose your whole yeah. sense of, of being and that your can cause identity. Your, yeah, identity. your identity, everything. Yeah. yeah. And that can cause a lot of anxiety and depression that mm -hmm. then substances become really appealing because you you're always sitting with this pain and anxiety and discomfort right. and you want you want to self medicate because you Mormonism didn't teach you how to deal with these negative emotions. No. And, and so yeah. some people self medicate and that's part of the deal. Right. Yeah, we we definitely, I would say, um, you know, definitely some of it, you know, and I and I look back, you know, and I didn't spend any of my early years after the church sober. Um, uh, you know, my husband and I, we had introduced alcohol as we were on the exit, um, you know, and that was more just to like, okay, we're going to experiment a little. It wasn't like an intentional, like, I'm going to, you know, full, full out go crazy here. But you know, then enter the fact that we just lost our tribe, <laughs> you know, we lost yeah. our community and we were looking for community. I mean, that's human nature to, to find community, to find me, you know, a sense of belonging, a sense of, you know, friendship and acceptance and love and, and, and open arms somewhere like, please take us, you know, yeah. um, we just 
got rejected. Um, and, and that's just, that's just human nature and that's, and it is what it is. So we were, you know, in this neighborhood where houses were being built. A lot of the people who moved into the houses that were next door to us were, um, Navy. We have a Naval base close by. There's a huge drinking culture in the Navy. So I would say we were never really introduced to (laughs) moderate or light drinking. Um, so, you know, we, we hosted like a Christmas party, invited our neighbors over, the booze started flowing, you know, and, and I was cautious in the beginning. It's like, okay, I'll have one drink and, and you feel the buzz. You feel, you feel that good feeling that alcohol gives you in the beginning. Um, you know, most of us would drink at night and then you sleep the hangover through because there is a physiological low that happens, you know, but if you keep drinking, you keep giving yourself that buzz. But over time you, you hit a low, it's a depressant. People forget that it is a depressant. Um, you know, and, and I, and I kind of disregarded that. I just kind of like threw, threw caution to the wind and, and, um, you know, we started drinking more with our neighbors and, you know, feeling that sense of community again, you know, through socializing, drinking, um, alcohol was always involved, um, cause it, that's how they live their lives. So we kind of just got adopted in, you know, to this, this kind of Navy culture of drinking, playing games, singing karaoke till two in the morning. I mean, it was like, it was ridiculous. And we it's were all fun, right? It was, it was a lot of fun. And, and, and I, I guess like, I would just say like, you know, I didn't realize what was happening at the time. It was fun. And I was beginning to associate and believe that the way to have fun was through alcohol. And can I, can I add one thing that is just, it's very personal. I don't want anyone to be hurt by this, but I'm just going to tell you my experience. Yeah. There, there's something about people drinking at a party or a get together where they seem to be uncomfortable if someone doesn't drink. And I would have always assumed that uh, anyone who drinks is like super cool and chill about it. And they're like, Hey man, Mm -hmm. I drink, but I don't care if you do, I'm not going to make an issue out of it. Right. But that's not what I've experienced. Like (laughs) if I go to a party with ex Mormons and everybody's drinking, literally no one is just like, Oh, cool. You're having Sprite. That's awesome. It's like, you're not drinking. Why aren't you drinking? And then there's always kind of this like, Oh, well, you're too good. Or, Oh, you're still hanging on to that. Or, Oh, do you judge us? Or there's, there's always a lot of negativity around it, or at least kind of there's an undercurrent, you know, that that's subtly there. Yeah. In fact, I, I, I know a group of guys who get together, they're great guys and they get together for this guy's night and they, they all drink. And I asked recently if I could attend the guy's night and I was told, no, you can't attend because you don't drink. And I'm th- I'm thinking yeah. like Mormons are, at least I know Mormons that are okay if you drink or not, but right. there's anyway, there's something weird about the peer pressure that I just have not expected. And I actually yeah. have kids that have experienced this in sort of, let's just say college settings as well. Talk about yeah. that. Do you have any insight into that? Cause I, I still don't totally. Yeah. Get it. Well, I think, I think the thing about drinking is I think deep, down and this could be a result of you know our upbringing in in the church where you know it's bad you don't do it like it's not godly it's not pure it's not you know that's the great and spacious building right i mean that is what it is and if and i think at least for me i at least in my experience you know i think people get really uncomfortable when someone is there in their presence that makes them look in their own mirror, you know, like, you know, that questions their drinking, like when in fact, it's actually them probably questioning their own drinking. Um, as I found through my experience is like, I was questioning my drinking all along the way, you know, um, is this good for me? You know, but I'm having so much fun. Is this good for me? Like, what am I doing? Is this, is this who I am? Like, I mean, I think it on a very like deep level does impact your questioning your own self and your own drinking. And, and, and I think deep down, you know, it's on like, on a, on a, it's 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 risky. risky. It's risky. It's, it is unhealthy. It is a poison. People for, <laughs> you know, it is flavored 
fuel. You know, it is, um, you know, in, in, it's hard to, it's hard to navigate that, you know, with people, you know, cause we, you know, my quitting drinking was, that was a big question for myself. Like, how the hell am I going to fit in with the crowd now? You know, like with the tribe that I've been drinking heavily with. And, and we don't want to jump ahead, but I yeah, just, yeah. But, there, but, yeah. but you acknowledge that there is peer pressure to drink and, <sighs> And yeah. that it might be just people worrying that they're being judged. Is that what you're thinking? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That there's some sort of form of judgment. And, you know, I've come around to think a lot of the judgment we project out on people is actually a judgment of our own self. Um, I know, just want so, all those post Mormon yeah. drinkers out there to know I'm yeah. not judging you. No, just no. Don't ask me. Stop asking me why I don't drink. <laughs> just let me have my beverage. You have your beverage. Yeah. And let's, let's karaoke. You right. don't have to ask me every single week why I'm not drinking because right. I don't want to have that conversation 50,000 times. Just let right. me do, my thing. Yeah. You do your thing. I'm not judging you. I promise. Yeah, no. And, and I don't pass judge. You know, I've learned, you know, like, you know, we're taught not to judge, you know, in the church. And that's a, that's a good lesson, you know, that I think we can, we can still value that, you know, that nugget of, you know, wisdom is, you know, don't cast judgment. People are living their lives figuring it out on their own and and really you just be present with who you are and be comfortable with who you are and your choices and stuff like that. So, okay. um, so moving forward. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of socializing with drinking stuff like that. Um, lots of partying. I mean, we were, there's this, this very prominent culture of like mommy wine culture and like all these you know, like the guys go out for drinks, or if we're having a Super Bowl party, everyone's drinking, or, um, you know, there's a kid's birthday, we might as well supply alcohol for the parents to survive it, right? Because these kids are screaming toddlers, you know, at this point. So, you know, it, it, it became a way of coping and dealing with just like kind of the mundane of life, you know, kind of a way to check out a little bit. Um, and my, and my, tell me if I'm wrong about this. My understanding is there's a group of people, maybe nine out of 10 that can drink just in moderation and it's not a problem. And it's, it's, it's not really yeah. in any way unhealthy. It's right. just, it's just if the, if the chamber and the Russian roulette sort of wheel falls on yeah. you or you happen to be one where it's because I don't want people to think we're anti-alcohol. Right. No, no, there's definitely, um, there's some thought out there about dopamine enhanced receptors, um, where, I mean, the alcohol releases the dopamine in the brain. Right. And so they, they, they get this signal in their brain a lot faster and they feel that pleasure a lot faster. Um, then I would say that genetically, I'm probably not one of those um, people that just is like, you know, like I have this addiction cycle of like those dopamine receptors get hit. It feels good. I crave it again. You know, like it was more just like I'm socially doing this. I'm being part of the crowd. You know, on my husband's side, I would say he's probably more of the like, you know, it's, it's hard to say no to more than just one, you know, uh, for me, I, I did have a little bit more control over, like, I didn't feel compelled unless I was, you know, drunk, you know, and like, I mean, it, it changes your judgment, you know, like how, how it affects you is going to be different from one person to the next. So, so there is science out there about it. Um, and we're not, we're not quote anti-alcohol in this episode at all. No, I mean, no, I'm not. no, you, can, you know, you and can I, be, but I'm not, yeah, you know, <laughs> and I have had friends, you know, that, that use it as a tool, like, um, you know, to, to calm the brain, to get out of their heads so they can enjoy sex, you know, like, I mean, it's, there are lots of reasons people, you know, drink and some of them, you know, sometimes it starts out innocently. I mean, it's a spectrum. So I mean, you just have to have it out there that it's a spectrum of how it's going to impact you in your life. You know, is it problematic? Is it too much? What is excessive drinking? You know, I didn't even know what that was. <laughs> so <laughs> I had no idea what the CDC even considered um, excessive heavy drinking. And, you know, until I really started looking at my own drinking um, this past winter. So, um, so yeah, so moving, moving along, you know, I think, Again, like I, I 
and for me, I don't want to be like this anti-alcohol, you know, person. I'm just saying this is my journey with it. And this is how I have come to where I am today. And, and that's, yeah, that's all, really. um, you know, but I think knowledge is power, you know, like I had beliefs about a faith and then I had beliefs about alcohol and I never knew I could apply the same, you know, questions or, you know, questioning of my beliefs about what, you know, the church was for me or the truth there. What is alcohol doing? Does it serve me? You know, like, does it, is it causing more problems than good? You know, those sorts of things. Like, you know, I, I thought I needed it to be social. Um, you know, and to fit into the crowd. And it's like, well, that's drunk Brittany or drinking Brittany fitting into a crowd. That's not me fully conscious, fully present me, you know, being social. Right. Um, so. Okay. So you fall yeah. into this kind of military culture, mommy, yep. mommy wine culture. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, and, and at this point there were, Plenty of, you know, I remember we traveled out to Idaho for um, my, for Thanksgiving in 2014. And, you know, we were hiding boxed wine at my in-laws place, which is terrible. But, you know, it's just like we were hiding it, secretive, you know, there's strained relationships, you know, in the family a little bit. So it was a way to escape and deal with the holiday, you know, and, and not really confront, you know, the emotions um, that were happening at the time, you know, um, feeling like a disappointment to his family that we were not raising the kids in the church, you know, those sorts of things kind of were all, all there. And we met up with some friends um, out there who had recently left the church too. And we met them in Boise. Um, we were staying a little outside of Boise, but we met up with them and um, drank and I drank until I threw up and then I drove home. I mean, it was not responsible on any level, but we were there talking about just the pain and like, you know, they had gone through a faith crisis and had left the church as well. And I mean, you know, we just, you know, it was, it, it was, you know, it's hard to see people going through that in their own way too, you know? And so how do you deal with it? You numb yourself to it. You, you, you cope with it by numbing yourself not confronting the pain and processing it. It's a way of stunting the processing, or at least it was for us, you know? Right. And, and so, you know, I, I remember driving back to where we were staying and I'm like, I can't believe I just drove like that home to, you know, where we were staying. Um, but so I was, started to take yeah. risks. It yes. got to the point where you started to take risks. Yes, started, you know, and this wasn't like a all the time risky behavior like thing, because I was like, you know, and of course, I regretted it. I was like, I can't believe I did that. That's not who I am. That's not where I thought this was going, you know, and so, you know, I was like, swear it off. I'm not I'm, not, I'm never doing that again. And then, you know, like, we'd be drinking with our neighbors, and I'd have too much and my husband would have too much. And I remember, you know, feeling a little bit of resentment towards, you know, it's like, you know, if he was going to drink excessively, you know, or if he didn't turn off his off switch, you know, with it, because he couldn't because he was inebriated, you know, like, we, you know, like, I had to be the responsible one. So I wasn't going to drink as much, you know, so it became this like, kind of like, okay, she's hung over in the morning. So he'd get up with the kids or like, he, you know, vice versa. Um, I mean, we were taking our baby monitor to the neighbor's house to, you know, stay up late on weekends. I, you know, Scott was traveling during the week. So the weekends were kind of our social let loose um, period. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it definitely spun, spun out of control, you know, not every weekend, but pretty darn frequently, you know, and then there's the whole, you know, like here in this area, business meetings for my husband, like meet at the bar after work, you know, and have a couple drinks, you know, so it kind of became like just a, a part of our lives. And I, I didn't see it coming, you know, I didn't see it. it, it was slow to develop, it was slow to creep in, um, you know, and I, and I, I was just like, what are, what are we doing? You know, and, and I just felt very divided about it um, at times. And then in 2015, I decided to go back to work and I got my dream job as a labor and delivery nurse. 
and I work night shift. So night shift is hard enough in and of itself. And drinking is terrible for a sleep. Um, there's a lot of science behind why it's awful for sleep. Um, Cause some people are like, Oh, I just need a good glass of wine to, to, to get to bed. It helps me. Right. It makes me sleepy. They'll say drinking right. makes me sleepy. So they associate good right. sleep with, with drinking. Right. Right. Yes, that does. That does happen. So yes, initially it does physiologically like, you know, kind of get you into that, like, I can doze off phase, but physiologically, when your body is processing, you know, the chemical, um, you know, and this is something I learned recently is like, alcohol in of itself is not poison, but your body when it processes it, makes acetylhyde, which is a toxin to your body. So I, you know, as I'm, you know, looking back, it's like, okay, so your body goes through this, you know, you feel the buzz for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe, and then you, you know, start to kind of feel like you're coming down off of it. So you get another drink, you know, so you're kind of trying to stay on top of this buzz, when physiologically, your body is like trying to process it and reach homeostasis. So, you know, it's like, okay, when do we normally drink? We drink in the evening, our body's crashing, you know, in the middle of the night when we're asleep. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night, just like, oh, like I feel like crap, you know, like, and, and I already had little kids waking me up in the middle of the night. So I was just, I was tired. I was sick more often. It does not help your immune system um, on any level. So, you know, I just, as I went back to work, um, you know, we were living a very busy, very full life of husband traveling. I was working. We had a nanny for the kids. You know, we partied with our friends on the weekend. Um, so it just kind of became this routine. And then it all started blurring together. I wasn't getting a whole lot done on the weekends or we, we weren't because we were more um, involved in just being social with our friends and drinking through it. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we, we definitely, you know, for a period there, um, it was, it was, it was a lot. Um, and so when I went back to work, I tried to tone it back, you know, so, you know, quite a bit because I couldn't do that to my body. It was just too exhausting. Um, but even through this, I was like, okay, I'm going to work out so I can have that glass of wine, like justifying, you know, like if I work out and stay healthy this way, I can have my drink, you know, or two or whatever. Um, you know, and this is all stuff that's happening in my own head. You know, this isn't something I'm like telling anybody. It's just like all this internal process, um, you know, of, of justifying, you know, my use of it. Um, so, you know, and, and there were some times where, you know, my husband drank excessively and some hurtful things were said or done or whatever. And it's, you know, that also then started creating this anxiety, you know, within me, um, like if he went to the bar after work, well, how long was he going to be there? Like, was he going to come home when he said he was going to, you know, like it was a social draw for him. It was his, his way of, you know, decompressing after work, that sort of thing. And, and oftentimes people feel like I've worked hard and I deserve that. You know, I deserve that, like kick back, you know, pop a beer, have a drink, feel that relaxation, you know, that it gives you, um, in the beginning, um, you know, and, and so it just becomes like habitual, I guess it becomes a part of your routine. And I feel like when you leave the church, you're kind of trying to figure out what your new routine is, what your new ways of relaxing or coping or, you know, all those things, like you're trying to figure them out because you used to have this place or system that you relied on, um, and it's not there anymore. So, uh, yeah, so there were, there were lots of, of nights of, you know, like lots of fun, but also there was tension building, you know, this, this tension, this resentment, you know, like that, you know, some things happened, they were hurtful. Is it going to happen again? oh my gosh, like, you know, every time like we drink, yes, we have a good time, but then there, there's this, like the highs are high, but the lows are low um, with it. So, so in, in my experience, it was, you know, a little excessive. And so I tried to pull back a fair amount. And then I, you know, started, you know, asking Scott, I'm like, you know, you need to check yourself, you know, like what's, what's going on with you, you know, 
your your drinking seems to be you know getting a little up there like we need to pull back let's try like 30 days you know sobriety that sort of thing and it's like you know you make it like maybe five or ten days in and it's like oh no there's a reason to drink again we're with our friends again it was really hard socially to pull away um but you know yeah. so that's when you start trying you see it's a problem so you mm -hmm. start trying to pull away or to reduce it right but yeah. it ends up being hard really hard to pull away from yes yeah very very difficult um you know, I mean, working, you know, there were a few times, you know, when we were downtown drinking with our friends, our neighbors, and like, I drove home, you know, thinking I was probably the most sober person in the group, you know, but not, um, you know, lucky I didn't get caught, you know, I have a, I have a license, you know, for my job and a driver's license, and that would not be good, you know, and I, I feel very fortunate that that never, you know, I never got a DUI or anything, but um, it will do people do and yeah. people have and and you know those are life changing you know things those go on your record and that's not you know something i was you know i was starting to think you know i need to really start questioning my own behaviors here i was questioning my husband's and i was questioning my own you know um with it and i you know at that point you know there was when I was working night shift, you know, I worked from 1030 to seven in the morning, um, initially. And I, oh, that's brutal. It is brutal, <laughs> but you know, babies happen at any, any time of day. So, right. <laughs> um, that's my job and I love it. So, um, so yeah, so I mean, I didn't go into work till 1030 sometimes. So if my neighbors were cracking a beer at five in the afternoon, you know, in the evening, like, it's like, yeah, I can probably have a drink or two before I go to work. And, and there was one shift that I remember going to work and still feeling a little buzzed. And, and, and that's a decision I had to live, with, you know, and then I downed a bunch of coffee so I wouldn't get that crash, you know, overnight. But, um, you know, I, I really, at that point was like, what am I doing? What am I doing with my life right now? Like, this is not healthy for me. Why, why can't I stop? You know, why can't I just say, no, I'm not going to drink anymore. So and at that was, point, it's yeah. not, it's not rational. It's just <clears throat> chemical, right? It's yeah. emotional. It's emotional. It's like a sense of security. Like if I drink, no one's going to question me, you know, like no one's, my friends who are drinking aren't going to point it out, you know, or yeah, it, 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 it was, it was the social part was really hard for me because I was such a shy kid, you know, it was a way for me to loosen up, to be able to like, you know, just have more fun and that sort of thing. And I thought if I take away the drinking, then that all goes away too, you know? So, um, so I didn't want to feel, you know, a disconnection again, I guess, per se, from people. Yeah, now all from, those things, yeah. all the fun you've had and all the friendships you've had, right? That where that's always involved, you worry, will I ever have fun again? And will I lose all these friends? Right? Will it will will I lose whatever good things have come into my life? Right? Is yeah, that right? yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, it had gotten to a point as well, you know, with our relationship where a lot of anxiety and a lot of concern had started to build around drinking for for us. And, you know, I pointed it out a couple times. And it was hard for my husband to stop, you know, as well. And, and I would just be like, Scott, like this, something's got to change. Like everything else, you know, we've come through so much with our relationship, with our faith crisis, you know, like we've, we've been through hell and back, you know, trying to get through this intact, you know, and I feel like this, this, this substance has moved into our lives and it's like taken a nice seat and it is in control, you know, like of our social life, of our emotions, you know, it's a way to cope. It's a way of dealing, you know, and it's like, I, I started getting kind of frustrated with it, you know, like, but at the same time, I found it so hard to stop. So, you know, I, you know, and I started bowling with a friend and, um, there's a big drinking culture around bowling and things like that. And so, you know, I just, you know, I had questioned my husband's drinking in about 2018 that summer, like I just kind of had had it with Scott's drinking because 
I felt like I had started to moderate, moderate, moderation is a tough game to play with, with a substance. It's, it is an addictive substance. Um, and, but it's also got a very high cultural acceptance. So it's, it's, it's tough to navigate that. Um, but you, you think, okay, I'm just going to pull back. But oftentimes when you pull back from it and say, I'm going to slow it down or I'm going to do less, like it creeps back into where it was. Like eventually it, you keep going back that direction towards um, however much you were drinking um, at most at one period of time. So it's, you know, and I, for myself kind of turned into like a weekend binge drinker at that point. Um, or when I was off work and people were being social, I was like, yeah, I'll go, you know, like we'll go to this wine and paint party and we'll all drink and have fun. And, you know, with my coworkers and, um, you know, different like social events around here where we live are like auctions for fundraising and the booze is flowing, you know, like there's lots of drinking and people will spend more money when they're drinking, you know? Um, and so it's, it kind of became this like, you know, well, what are we going to go do, you know, for fun? We're going to go and hang out at the bar, have a drink, you know, or go out to dinner and have some drinks or, you know, if it's, you know, any sort of like, if there's a baby shower, there's alcohol at it, you know, it's just very different, you know, from what I grew up around, but it was part of how we did things here for, for that period. So, so when I started questioning, you know, Scott's drinking and being like, look, this is out of control. Like this needs to stop. I want this stuff out of our lives. Um, you know, he, it was a difficult conversation and it was very, heated in the beginning, but I just felt like alcohol had hijacked my spouse. It had hijacked my life. You know, it's like, I don't feel like I, I don't feel like I can control it. Therefore it is controlling me, you know? Um, so, so after that, we, you know, Scott reached out to, um, a friend of ours who he had met drinking and she happens to be a nurse as well. And she, um, has since been through rehab and is, um, you know, recovering from alcohol and opiate use, um, herself. And she runs her own like coaching business now for recovery. And she gave us some resources, a book called this naked mind, which I highly recommend, um, for people who are struggling with drinking. Um, and, she she wrote a book this woman Annie Grace wrote a book excellent book but she also runs a podcast where people tell their stories or they have reader questions and that sort of thing and it's pretty pretty impactful so we got some resources from her and I was more focused on Scott's drinking because I felt like I was in control of mine more than he was even though I still couldn't just quit it myself um but he, you know, he got these resources with the podcast and then Recovery Elevator as well as a podcast that's run by a man named Paul Churchill. Um, and it's people telling their stories when it started, what their rock bottom was, you know, how they got out of it, um, <clears throat> those sorts of things. And um, as, as you know, John, like the power of story, you know, through experience and, and stuff, it's, it's very impactful. And so I started listening to these podcasts because I wanted to know what Scott was listening to because I was more focused. I was like, I'm fine. And at this point, I had really stopped drinking with my husband because I just, I couldn't be around him when he was drinking. I just, there was this division, kind of this, this wedge between us that was alcohol. And, um, you know, it was a huge strain on our relationship for, for a period of time. And, and that was hard knowing I had fought so hard for it post faith crisis and now alcohol was here and you know here I am again fighting for for my marriage over this substance um you know and and so we started listening to these podcasts and I would binge listen to these podcasts kind of like I did with you know my faith crisis and I'd be like like I'm ready to stop drinking I can do this. And I'd, I'd listen, listen, listen. And then I'd be like, all right, I'm going to do it. And then the weekend would come and I would just fall back into, to drinking with, you know, my bowling buddy and, you know, not thinking too much of it. 
And, and then it really created this internal battle, you know, kind of like with the church, you know, like this cognitive dissonance, like, I know it's not good for me. It's not good for my marriage. It's not good for my relationship. You know, it's causing problems yet. I'm still participating in it, you know, and, and that's, that's where it had me. It had, had that control. I didn't feel like I could be social without it. I didn't feel like I could let my guard down without it. I didn't think I could be fun without it. You know, I wanted to fit in. I didn't want to be this black sheep again, you know? Um, so, so yeah, it, it became problematic. And, and so I struggled for about six months, you know, with this, like, I need to stop, but I can't, and I need to stop, but I can't. And so, you know, I'd heard many people in the podcast with this naked mind say, you know, your book changed my life, you know, and I was like, well, how powerful could a book be? And I could not believe that I just didn't apply the same things, you know, about questioning my own belief system about the church and faith and God. I didn't think I could do that with alcohol, but I could. And so I was like, okay, I will try this book and I will order it and I will read it and I will see what happens. Um, And I read it and it really went through a lot of the subconscious, you know, beliefs that I was holding, you know, about drinking and about alcohol and what it was. Um, And it really just laid it all out on the table for me. And Um, I took my last drink on February 23rd. And from that point, I have not had anything since. So, you know, it worked really well for me in debunking everything I thought alcohol was giving me, it was actually taking more than it was giving me. And therefore, for me, it's like, you know, with the church, it was, you know, the balance tipped, and it, became very real to me, you know, what example I was setting for my children regarding drinking, um, what I was, you know, um, doing to my body for my health, my mental health, you know, my well being, And I shared, you know, my thoughts with, you know, Scott about it, um, after I read it and that I was, you know, going to be sober from this point forward. And, you know, at that point, his drinking ramped up again, um, a little bit. Um, and I was just like, what is going on? Why can't we just get this stuff out of our lives, you know, easily? It was, it was really difficult. So, um, moving forward, you know, at another point, we, you know, kind of hit another low point in our relationship where, you know, we're questioning, you know, his drinking, I'm sober now, like, how does this work? You know, I never thought in my, you know, when we first got married that I would be dealing with something like this, this huge monster, you know, in, in our marriage. And, you know, it's like, do I want to be married to someone who excessively drinks? You know, like, is that good for, for me, my mental health? Like it wasn't, you know, and so it's like something's got to change. And so, you know, we reached out to a counselor, you know, got involved with couples counseling to work through, you know, a lot of these things. And, and I'm super proud of Scott. He's, you know, been sober for more than a month now, which is huge considering the last seven years have been, you know, um, very much filled with drinking um, and using alcohol for all sorts of reasons. So. Wow. Congratulations, Scott. Yeah. Yeah. But can you, can you take us through just a little bit more slowly, mm-hmm. how how you went down the road of successful change. So I know yeah. that I know that they need to get the book, and I've already pasted yeah. a link, um, you awesome. know, for people that that want to access this book and the podcast yeah. directly. Again, the uh, the link is what it is. This naked mind.com. This naked mind.com. Yeah. But if you can just give us a, a just a sense for how what you did yeah. that was different. Right. Um, yeah. So I've been thinking a lot about this um lately. Like ever since, you know, I started like over a year ago kind of questioning my drinking, going through the process of struggling with moderation, struggling to, you know, um, you know learn more about why am I doing it? Like really questioning myself and questioning, you know, what was driving it, um, you know, and, and, and arming myself with some knowledge, you know, like knowledge is power for sure. 
Um, you know, I didn't know the CDC considered eight drinks a week for a woman is considered heavy drinking. I was definitely meeting criteria, you know, like for that. And for men, it's 15 drinks. And I was like, wow, like that's a little eye opening to me because I thought I was actually doing pretty dang good. <laughs> I was like, I'm not, you know, drunk all the time. I'm not, you know, going to work drunk, you know, maybe once in my life I did that, but not drunk, but buzz. But, um, you know, I've driven a couple times, you know, when I shouldn't have, um, but I'm not doing this on a regular basis. So I justified, you know, my drinking as like, I'm okay in this moderation game that I'm trying to play. So part but, of it was getting educated yeah. about what, what really qualifies as problematic drinking. Right. Yeah. I mean, I remember years ago when I started questioning my husband's drinking and mine, like Google searching, you know, what is alcoholism? Like, what is excessive drinking, you know? And I started like trying to figure out what that looked like, you know, but I kind of was in a little bit of denial that that was me. Like that was part of my life. And, um, you know, and after the church and feeling like, you know, I had really, um, been disenfranchised by organized religion period. And I had often associated spirituality with being religious. And so this past, um, you know, six, seven months since I decided to, you know, be sober, um, was really probably driven also by a search for spirituality again. Um, you know, finding something, you know, to spiritually feed my soul, you know, um, you know, how am I going to live the best life I can, you know, and there's been times, especially with the drinking, you know, or quitting drinking. And I've been like, you know what, if I've got just one life to live and I don't know if there's an eternity and I don't know these things anymore, you know, like why not just drink and have a good time and, you know, do these things and, and, and not care, you know, like just, just, just do it, you know? And, and, you know, at the end of the day, it was like, well, I'm really lacking in my, you know, sense of purpose and spirituality and, and things like that. So that was also just kind of a, like, I felt this void that needed to be filled and alcohol was pouring down that void, but never filling it up. Um, so, you know, I went on kind of a bender for spirituality, I guess, um, reading a lot of Eckhart Tolle, um, The Untethered Soul, uh, Byron Katie's Loving What Is, Embracing Brené Brown's, you know, information. So you, out you found yeah. out that you had a spiritual void from leaving Mormonism that you didn't fill with something better. Correct. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. And I, and I'm like, how, how did it take me so long to realize this? But you know, life's a journey, not a destination. Um, and so in, in realizing this void was there, you know, I was just like, I just, you know, I need, I need something. I need some purpose back in my life. You know, I need to understand, you know, my place in the universe again, you know, and what that means. And, you know, when I, when I left the church, I got a tattoo on my back, um, not right afterwards, but a little bit afterwards. And it's birds in, in various forms of flight. Um, and it says, um, Oh gosh, that's terrible, Brittany. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what my tattoo says on my back. You'll have but... to show us. No, I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> yeah. Um, so let it go. Just let it be. No more fears, just flying. And, you know, I flew quite a bit, you know, after leaving the church, I had this new sense of freedom, no rules, no boundaries, you know, regarding drinking or whatever, you know, just like I felt like, okay, I get to pick up the pieces, look at them, put my life back together in whichever way form, you know, I get to reevaluate my values, my morals, you know, all those things like you review and, you know, keep some, toss others. And um, so in that, you know, flight, I guess, per se, I was just kind of like this careless, you know, like flying around, just kind of like wandering, you know, maybe 40 years in the desert. I don't know, <laughs> like trying to figure it out. And, um, you know, a couple years ago, I was like, well, I kind of need some direction and purpose too, you know, but I didn't really know what that looked like um, until I kind of realized how 
how much I had not been tending to the spiritual side of myself. Um, so when I read this Naked Mind and another book called Alcohol Explained by William Porter and started delving into Eckhart Tolle and just really starting to understand how we build our identity, how we build, you know, what the ego is in my life, you know, what all these like, you know, like going into the psychology of the human mind and, and stuff like that, there was definitely a shift um, that I felt in myself um, and call it a spiritual awakening or whatever, but it definitely felt different um, in addressing, you know, things I was struggling with. Um, you know, I found, you know, a lot of peace um, that came from making that decision for myself. You know, it's like, you know, when I first stopped drinking, you know, I mean, my parents eventually found out we drank, of course, you know, we went to a meeting once at a restaurant and I was like, I'm going to order a Cosmo before my parents get here so I can have a drink before they see me. Mm -hmm. um, and they showed up early. So I was like, <laughs> hi, mom, dad, I drink, you know. Um, I, I also feared my parents you know, reacting in a way to my now stopping drinking as kind of like, well, we told you so the church told you not to, right. you know, like, yeah. yeah, you know, it was just like, I didn't want them. I didn't want to give them the, you know, the, <laughs> the excitement of being right, you know, about booze or whatever. Um, and that's part of why, I mean, that's, it's, it's such a temptation when you leave the church, it's like, okay, what was my identity as a Mormon? Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. no tattoos, no extra piercings, no alcohol, no drugs, you know, no extramarital sex. Right. Okay, well, if I leave the church and I'm not going to be a Mormon anymore, then I've got to be the opposite of all those things. Yeah. And that includes, oh, spirituality, can't have that because that, you know, that's, I've got trauma associated with the church. Yeah, totally. And so you just, you go the opposite. And that means I got to try drugs, got to drink alcohol, got to have extramarital sex. Right. Have spirituality. And that's, that's not a recipe necessarily for success, right? No, in my experience, I will say no, that is not but it, the pendulum sh certainly swings, you know, like if you think about, you know, you're kind of living this one extreme, and then you're just like, then you let the pendulum go and it swings far the other way, you know, and as it swings, you know, eventually you need to find center, you know, it's, it, you know, living the extremes is is really a rough place to be so um yeah so really finding you know i really embrace the Tao Te Ching um as a as a spiritual guidance source for um being at peace um being at non-resistance you know being at surrender um you know with things as they are um you know living you know my truth you know having integrity back in my life feeling like the cognitive dissonance has dissipated has been really um really helpful um you know I, i'm not battling i'm not spending any energy battling whether i should drink or not you know like there's a lot of like energy and emotion and stress and anxiety and and depression that you know all like stews in um in that internal battle so i mean just like it did with you know leaving the church you know like these things you you know there's there's discontent like and i've really found that you know to be truly present and conscious and you know aware and my best version of myself it, it's it's without drinking um and that's and that's for me you know and i'm and i quit for myself you know i didn't do it as a i'm gonna quit and i hope scott quits too it's like no like i had to really focus on my own internal well-being spirituality health mental wellness um you know just you know being comfortable in my own skin um, you know, embracing myself for who I am, my flaws, all of it, self love, those things have been a huge player in, um, in really being able to feel like, you know, there's a huge shift, you know, spiritually within myself. And I feel, you know, that I can, I can live my life without all this extra noise so much better now than I have in the past, you know, seven years since leaving the church. So, you know, it's, 
it's been it's been huge and i've been open with my parents about it um along the way you know it's like i'm not going to hide that part of my struggle anymore from my family um you know they're they've been there because i was the like way. Brittany, why would you want to come on mormon stories and talk about you know your alcohol abuse problem why in the world would you want to do that uh you know i think you know to give people hope that you know there is a way out of that struggle um that you're not alone you know out there i think knowing that you're not alone in the struggle whether it's leaving the church or dealing with substance abuse or addiction or that sort of thing you aren't alone there are people out there you know who have left the church who understand you know the context in which you know the story that you lived you can relate you know to people along the way and you know my my hope is that people you know will you know hear my story or you know feel a connection there um and you know be inspired to live their best best self you know it's possible and you know if you at all have questions, you know, your drinking or your faith or, you know, your spirituality or whatever, like there are resources, there are people out there, you know, wanting to, to be your support system, to cheer you on. Um, definitely a huge part of, you know, dealing with drinking or leaving it is that you can't do it for anybody else. Really, you have to do it for yourself. Um, you know, and that was something I had to accept about my husband. You know, I really like I, I have this type A part of myself that wants to control and have, you know, things the way I want them and, and stuff like that. And I knew I wanted him to stop drinking. But really, at the end of the day, like he needed to make that decision for himself. And I had to be okay with that. I, I recognize his humanity, his, his own internal struggles are, are not a reflection of anything I've done or his intention is not to hurt me, you know, it's, he's struggling too, you know, we all struggle with, you know, different emotions and, and, and we cope differently and, and, you know, being more open and honest and talking about those things is just um, something that needs to happen more. I think, I think, you know, like we were saying in the beginning, it's like, you know, when you struggle with something, why do you not reach out to the person closest to you and say, hey, you know, like, I'm really hurting right now, please help me or just be my shoulder to cry on or, you know, what did you do? Or how do you deal with this? Like, you know, just opening conversation is super important. Okay, so, so. it sounds like some of the things are admitting you have a problem, get educated, um, fill your spiritual void so that you feel spiritually full yeah. and then talk about it, get help, yeah. um, find good resources for health, open up about it and kind of own it. Those are some of the things I'm hearing. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, there's, there's lots of different resources out there. You know, their AA is huge, you know. Um, yeah, I, I do know Mormons, post-Mormons that have had good experiences with AA. Yeah, because it has a spiritual component to it, like the higher power, God, whatever you want to call it, you know, like it's a familiar, probably language on some level. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, the struggle, you know, I think for most of us internally is we can hear these things, but do we believe them? Do we believe we are worthy? Do we believe we deserve happiness? Do we believe that we deserve love and acceptance, you know, and um, especially of your own self? And so I don't, you know, I think anything that touches on those or helps empower you to take control and um, uh, control in your life and empowers you to make decisions that are the best for you, for your family, whatever, like all those resources, whatever they are, however you come to that, you know, is, is really going to be very individual. But um, there are some amazing resources out there. Um, for for support i uh the girl tiffany that pointed me towards the podcast that we listened to and i still listen to um runs like a sharing circle for a group called she recovers um and it's you know nice to meet other women you know who have different stories none of them you know grew up in the mormon church but you know we all think we're very different from each other but we all struggle with a lot of similar things and so um 
you know, I think it's important to, to share and continue, you know, the conversation. And I think it, you know, I don't want to be stuck in this, you know, place of like, I'm in recovery and I'm a victim of like this, you know, fallout in the system or, you know, like, I don't want to take on a victim role and, you know, hold on to that. I want to be able to move past it to say, you know what, like I've been through this now, what's the next step to, to move forward?